Welcome to Beyond Boundaries, a series of virtual sessions initiated by Takshila Educational Society to further ideas that foster learning, self-expression, and ingenuity. We at Takshila are keen on connecting young minds to an unbound range of themes, thoughts, and perspectives that facilitate their understanding of the world and its concerns. At this time of global crisis and social distancing, the sessions under Beyond Boundaries bring articulate speakers from the world of art, education, literature, science, and more to engage your time and mind. The speaker will converse for about 30 minutes on a topic of her or his expertise. You may submit a question by typing it out in the chat box of our YouTube channel. All questions from the audience will be answered collectively by the speaker in the next 15 minutes of the session. Good evening uh, and welcome. Thank you uh, so many hundreds of parents for logging on uh, to this um, session, perhaps the first in the series uh, organized by Takshila Education Society. I'm honored and privileged to be here. Uh, my name is Sujata and I work and live in Goa. Uh, so it's also so exciting that from the small region I'm able to reach so many of you in, in bigger places uh, in this country. Uh, and perhaps this is one of the experiences that when we look back at this um, time, we will think of, ah, oh, we also did that. Uh, so welcome again. Uh, what I'm going to try and do for the next uh, 16 to 17 minutes is just walk you through my imagination and understanding of why reading with and for children is so important in the lives of our children. And I would really welcome your thoughts, your questions, because for me, I'm an interactive educationist and I practice directly with community and educators. And this whole idea of distance is something I'm still wrapping my head around. It's not easy for me to talk to an audience I cannot see. So I urge you to think of questions you may have, comments you may make, uh, and to please send them to me through, uh, through the space um, uh, Takshila has provided on this forum. And I'll do my very, very best to answer uh, your queries and respond to your comments. Uh, so we'll start by looking at, at, a, at, a, at a slide uh, that will begin our uh, conversation for this evening. Uh, I want to share a quotation with you by a fairly well-known or very well-known children's writer, particularly uh, for children or communities from North America. His, his pen name, the name he wrote with, is called Dr. Seuss. And uh, I want you to read that for about five seconds, and then I really want to talk a little bit more about what that quote means, yeah? So we'll move to that quotation. Uh, Shraddha. So really this quotation, by the time that pops up, I'm going to just uh, read it out for you. Uh, okay, so we're looking at my first slide, which is on reading with and for children. Uh, can we move to the second slide, Shraddha, please? Yeah, so what I'm, I said what I'm going to do, which is share a quotation from a well-known and well-read writer whose pen name is Dr. Seuss. Uh, Dr. Theodore G. Sil was his actual name. And let's read it and talk a little bit more about the idea of this quote. So Shraddha, can we go next? Yes. 
So this is something we all believe in actually, and we all subscribe to. And I want to spend some moments with you really thinking, why do we think that the more you read, the more things you will know, and then the more that you learn, the more places you'll go, where are these ideas coming from? Uh, and when did they even start? Because reading is very much something that came to popular culture, came into homes, into everyday homes, only in the 20th century or late 19th century. Before that, the world ran fairly well uh, without reading. So where does this idea come from that we've got to read? And when you read, you know. And when you know, you're actually learning. And because you're learning, you're going to go someplace. Uh, as we think about this, we are all going to hopefully arrive at the same answer, that it came largely from the school system of education. When schools got formed in, in, in our societies, the one way in order to teach large groups of children knowledge and to bring learning to them quickly and efficiently was to put things into a code that everybody could read. And when you read the code, we felt that, okay, now you know and you understand what you're reading and then you come to learn and therefore you'll be able to do what you should do in life. And therefore, from very, very long back, this idea of reading has very tightly been married to the idea of learning. And all over the world, particularly in our country, in India, we insist that children read because we feel that they will become smarter and they will do well in school and then they'll get good marks, they'll fare well in their tests and then they will uh, move forward. But is that the only reason we should read? This is really what I want us to think about uh, for the next day. 10 minutes today. So if Shraddha can please move to the next slide, it will greatly help me. Yeah, so is reading only about marks or is it more than marks? And I feel confident that many of you, when you quietly introspect, you will arrive at the uh, same conclusion that Marks, when we look back as adults, actually, how much have they helped us know and understand the world? How have our marks helped us to be better human beings? How have our marks helped us to make decisions and choices for ourselves, for our family, for our community? The answer is, if they don't really help us. But what helps us is beginning to become deeply empathetic human beings. What has helped us is beginning to understand things from another person's point of view. What helps us is beginning to know more about the world without actually leaving your part of the world. I can read and learn about a community that's sitting far away uh, and recognize their problems or appreciate what they've done simply because I have built my reading mind. And so reading, I want to place here, is not only for scholastic achievement, even though it is one of the strongest indicators of who becomes successful in schools. So there are studies that show us that children who read, and this is not reading for marks, not reading for tests, but children who read do well academically. So I'm going to ask you, young parents of young children from nursery to class three, to think you are at the beginning of a wonderful journey with your children. You encourage reading for pleasure over reading for learning, hard school learning. Because if you put the seed reading for pleasure, you have actually put place the seeds for school learning and the seeds for so much, so much more that we know from research that he brings us. So I'm going to ask uh, Shraddha to move to the next slide, which has a very small multiple choice question for us all to think about. The question is, what percentage of 
all relies on the ability to read. I'm guessing all of you, all 600 plus of you have chosen 85% and you are all right. If I could see you right now, I'd be clapping for you. Uh, but the point I want to make here is reading is not just text reading. It's not just reading print on paper or on screen. We're reading all the time. When you look at a picture, a poster, an advertisement, you're reading. When you walk into a meeting room and there is a particular mood, you're reading. When you come home at the end of the day and your child looks at you and there's a communication, you all are reading each other. So as human beings, in some expanded way, we are reading all the time. But because I'm a literacy educationist and I believe very much in the power of reading the code that's reading what is printed, I'm also arguing that in the 21st century, all our learning, almost all our learning comes from the act of reading. Reading print, reading code, reading symbols on some particular surface. It could be paper or screen. I thought this particular example of what we're experiencing during this lockdown is really in some ways dividing our country into those who can read and those who can't read. All of us who can read are accessing so much of content online. Oh, we're watching television or we're watching net Netflix, or we are listening to podcasts, or we are reading digital books, or we are reading analog books. And those of us who have not been brought into this, um, this world of reading are actually shut out and left out of perhaps one of the most powerful ways in which we keep our minds alive. So our learning does rely on reading. And this brings me to the next slide, which is what can parents do, particularly you young parents of young children, uh, so, so full of potential at this point in time, what can you do? So I have just five bullet points and I'll read out in case somebody is not looking at the screen. The first thing I thought of was that you need to recognize that reading is not about testing and school success alone. I'm just reiterating what I said at the beginning. We need to shed that idea that read only for marks or only for school learning because that's what makes reading hard for our children. And motivation to read is one of the strongest indicators of reading success. People who like to read don't find reading difficult. People who don't like to read struggle with reading. Now, where does like and dislike come from? It comes from the way we as parents introduce reading to our children. So if we say, Padna, you must read, then you are already putting a burden on this act of reading. The second point would be that reading and writing are highly interconnected. And this is again something our school system looks at often very differently. It thinks it, it, it structures them as separate subjects or separate activities. But actually, when you think of it, it, there was no writing before. There was nothing to read. You can only read when somebody has written something. So in the genesis of these symbol systems, drawing has come much before the act of reading. And drawing is a form of writing, particularly for very young children. So we must create opportunities for our children to draw what they want to tell us. It doesn't have to be these perfect artistic creations. That is not the kind of drawing I'm talking about. I'm talking of just representing something. So you and I want to go to the shop. We can't go because of the lockdown. Let's draw a map to say how we would have gone to the shop. And you'll be astounded at how a three and a four year old will actually trace the route, talking to you, telling you first we'll go down the steps, then we'll take a left, we'll do this, we'll cross the road. All of this is building a symbol system in the mind, which is the beginning of our reading brains. When you take a 
code and you're able to talk about the code and put that code down on paper. Playing, we, we often say, nah, okay, now enough of playing, come and study. But playing is one of the most powerful pedagogic tools of how children learn. Pretend play, many of us did it in our childhoods. I don't know how many of you did. Pretend play, we played ghar ghar and we played teacher teacher and we played different kinds of make-believe games where I become something else. I take on an imaginary role and I play out that role. This is all called early literacy skills. We are building the mind for the act of reading. The third thing is read to your child. And I know as parents, especially when there is no lockdown, we lead extremely busy lives, extremely stressful lives. And sometimes the reading to your child does not find time. But I also have met hundreds of parents who once they are convinced about something, make the time. So I'm going to trust the research that is there that children who become readers are all children who have been read to. And so please be, make a practice of reading to your child. Read with your child. This is perhaps one of the most enjoyable things, just like playing carom with your child, playing cards, playing games. When you read with your child, you both become partners. It changes the relationship around reading. And it doesn't mean that you always have to be talking, uh, reading, uh, you know, with a book. But talking about books or talking about a film or talking about a series also are all things that prepare our mind for what we call the critical acts of reading. Because reading is not about just decoding and telling the sounds and saying this is butterfly and this is tree and that is fish. It's also about knowing what is butterfly, what is fish, what is tree. And it's also about saying, really, is that a fish? I don't know. I'm not sure who, who's giving me this information that this is the fish. And this is actually what it is to be literate, to be a critical reader. So we have to begin with our young children to start talking about things right from the early ages because you prepare the mind for becoming a critical reader. Shraddha, if you'll go to our next slide, I've got just three things that you need to start doing. Is when you do find a book to read or you do find something you want to share with your child, the first rule is to read it yourself. Even if a very trusted, reliable person or your librarian in the school or your teacher has recommended it, Read it yourself because that prepares you for that talking that I spoke about. I've met many parents who do something that I think damages the reading joy for children. We feel that you need to push yourself to read. So even if the book is slightly difficult and it is hard and the child is saying, this is too much, you say, nah, nah, just try, repeat it, go with it, do it. But actually this study show us build frustration and frustration lowers motivation and lower motivation makes reading hard so it's perfect perfect to start sometimes with a book that is slightly easier than where your child is reading so you have a child in the third standard there is no harm in choosing a book that somebody may say a six-year-old child enjoyed how lovely let, let the eight-year-old child also enjoy it because joy of reading comes from these things. And we have to slowly build these levels of reading and not to put too hard material in the world of your child. And I'm going to keep repeating this, that we read first for joy, not for testing. So don't ask, what did you learn from this book? Acha, okay, give me the spelling of this word. Uh, what is the meaning of this word? You have taken away the joy that that content could have brought the child. So hold yourself back. And that's why if you've read the book beforehand, you will be able to talk also about the joy that the book brought you or the questions the book has raised for you. And I would urge you to please remember that we are trying to put our children on a journey of reading for joy, because everything else falls in place after that. 
So to come to very practical things, some of you will say, Acha, all this is all very nice and sounds very good, but where do we get books from and how do we select books? And these are very, very, very practical questions. Since we are in this lockdown period, I thought one most precious way to begin a reading journey is to remember stories from your childhood to remember stories that you already know because storytelling is very much a part of reading joy learning to listen to stories loving stories responding to stories it all comes from the act of storytelling so please think who told you a story when you were young how did you feel would you like to play that role for your child? So I some stories, even if an anecdote four years old, what you did, or what the world was like when you were four years old. It's, all of these are stories. These are live stories that our children will make. I, I know that you don't have access perhaps to your school library or to any other library in your community, but I'd like to think that in your home there may be one or two books, and if there aren't, hopefully you have neighbors' books, you have friends who have books. This is a brilliant time to be in these WhatsApps and have a book you can leave outside our door or at the side or somewhere that I pick up because we are trying to make story reading an everyday event in our house. There is right now an explosion on the internet of online resources. In fact, I'm worried that it's too much and everyone's getting overwhelmed. But I have put together some uh, resources in a list which I will share with Shraddha and she will circulate amongst you. These are links to some read alouds that are already there on uh, available that you can click for your child to watch. But I urge you to not leave your child alone with the screen. Use this as a time to read with your child. So both of you enjoy the story together. And one amazing way to look for stories is actually to find advertisements, to find something in a magazine or newspaper, open it and ask your child, so what do you think is happening here? What happened before this picture? What will happen after this picture? Make up your own stories you will be surprised how precious this experience is how much you get to know your child in doing this and how much your child learns about the act of reading from this engagement with print uh shraddha if you can please uh, move forward so after access and, yeah i was on access and selection shraddha sorry i moved without telling you which was to awaken, yeah. So then we'll move to making time, which is really, I'm sorry, but it's putting demand on you as a parent because this is that important an activity. So I'm urging you to be present. Don't give a book to your child and then you go and do something else. Don't talk about a book while you're busy getting dinner ready, especially in this lockdown time. I think it's a precious time to put practices in place. So be present, that's all this slide is saying. Make time and be present, physically, emotionally, intellectually for your child. Uh, Shraddha, could we move to the next slide, which is just a reminder slide that actually reading is fun. Once a child is hooked onto this joy of reading, I assure you, that it is fun, not just for your child, but actually even for you. Families that read together are often really uh, committed, motivated, happy families. So please try this idea that reading is fun and can be fun. I'm going to pause now uh, and I'm putting, asking Shraddha to put the next slide, which has my email address. Uh, which if you have questions, you want any resources, you want me to talk to you about something, my commitment to reading is very, very high and I would be honored to help. So don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to me. And for the next 10 
minutes typing the questions. So uh, please use the chat box that has provision. And uh, yes, and I'm happy to hear you. Okay, so I'm going to read out the questions because I think we should all, or, uh, you know, we all learn from them. So the first one, which says I'm not a reader, how do I select books for my child? Yes, I recognize this. This is sometimes hard now. You don't have a history of having read books. And so you think, what books should I choose? Uh, the, this is where the online resources are exciting because there will be book lists available for different ages. If you want more Indian specific themes and suggestions, please send me an email with the age of your child and I'll send you uh, a, a book list. I know that the actual education schools, DPS school libraries have recommended lists. Those would be a very good place to start. Uh, a parent asks, yes, that the home language is very different from both the language of communication in school, which is Hindi, as well as English. Yes, yes, parents who speak Bangla and Assamese, uh, reading books will help, but please don't write of Bangla and Assamese. Uh, the richness of your culture will come through when you tell your children stories in your own languages as well, and also draw on the literature of your own languages. But yes, reading every in English will definitely help English comprehension. It's one of the strong indicators of, of, of building uh, literacy is being read to every day. So if you could read a short story every day to your child, you're giving your child the experience of hearing standard English, which is the, the English we write, which is often you know, grammatically correct, high vocabulary, in, in a joyful way, you know, you know, because it's coming through a story. Uh, yes, the, the Benton and the pick sticker books. Yes, I know. Uh, I often say that we must understand just like how we have food diets, we have reading diets. So just like we believe that and, and accept that there is junk food, there is slightly junk <laughs> And often the reading material is promoted very well, marketed very highly, and it hooks our children very, very powerfully. So one very simple rule of thumb, which I've tried to use in our own libraries, and because the children actually have a relationship with me, they listen, is that I actually say you can take one popular fiction book, which is often these books that, you know, I call in my head junk food, but you have to read one good book for me. And I praise the good book and I make that good book sound like some kind of magical uh, dish that actually they take it because one, one thing we must know is a good diet actually prepares your brain for a good diet. So when you've read enough of good material, your brain is able to tell ki, this is not such a great book. And that's what we want from our children. So motivation, again, uh, and, and having a conversation, a healthy conversation with the child, explaining why we think Ben 10 books, activity books, uh, Geronimo Stilton kind of books are fun. They give us a rush of pleasure, but that's it. It doesn't do more. And reading has the power to do more. So can you please agree that we are going to try and use that dream gives us and read something else. Yes, this urge to get our children to read fluently on their own is of me personal, growing in my own children growing on their own. Now I can start reading. But it should never be that way. Uh, there are enough of studies to say that reading aloud is something that you continue throughout the life of a reader 
and you yourself will note those of you who listen to podcasts you're actually being read aloud too uh, and there is something joyful in that and some of us have a, a tendency to like to listen and learn rather and read and learn but fluency if you just look at this word fluency it's about doing something with practice and speed so unfortunately it requires that discipline of little practice and speed uh, so developmentally what i understand is actually by not giving our children physical books and by not giving our children enough of time and space to move their bodies we are slowly changing the 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 way our brains function so if you have a choice i would urge you to start with skill book to start with physical play way before you move a child to a screen because a screen as you know for us focus attention in a particular way that very young children they need to be doing things for their bodies and mind to develop so don't fall into the trap um, nowadays everybody is on the internet so put your child very early they are these are digital natives these are children who are hardwired to get onto the screen with ease so they will get it they will pick it up so please try and restrict if you can uh the parent whose son says he does not love reading uh are you reading with him and what is the books you're choosing to read uh, what are his interests how can we begin with what the child wants to do uh because in that may be the hope of motivation <laughs> my daughter who's in class 2 does not want to do anything with her just to be lover let her live, stay with whichever language she is happy because english is all around us na she'll be bright enough to uh, acquire it and school system will 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 ensure she gets it i feel you shouldn't worry how to make children speak english uh i'm not really sure if we should have any formal way to make them speak english i think uh, one way is to read books in english aloud to them uh so that they are listening to it and when you listen to english then you're beginning to understand english and then life is like that right it will give us an opportunity to actually practice what we understand so i think this is a multilingual country of ours we we don't have to all be speaking english in fact i wish we spoke less english and honored our own language is some more yes please it is essential to read in your mother tongue your culture your life the ways of your family are all embedded in your mother tongue don't ever lose sight of that okay so i i i've been waiting for this moral question so thank you whichever parent raised it we've all been raised on a diet of moral stories no ki what does this story teach you what is the lesson in this in this story but those are only one kind of stories if you actually explore what are the stories available for children you will see there are various kinds there are stories just for joy there are stories about fantastical things that happen in the world there are stories that connect with my life that when i look at that boy he's exactly like i was he's doing the things i'm doing and suddenly i feel more connected there are stories that will transport my mind somewhere else and take me to another place and then there are teaching stories that have been written and are now being produced in order to tell us a lesson that's one kind of story in fact i find it sorry to say the weakest kind of story because the true lesson is learned by the sense of it not when somebody tells me this is the moral of the story i have to think about the story and say yeah this is what it tells me and every He will tell you something whether it is morally written or not 
So what I think, if you're asking me, will it expand the child's dimension of thought? Yes, it will very much. So how you ask it is important. Rather than what did you learn from the story? What is the moral of the story? Did you agree with what the character did? What would you have done if you were the crocodile? Do you know anybody who would be exactly like the crocodile? Now, you're beginning to think about moral questions through the story. And that has much more power than saying we should not be selfish or we must share. Hmm. The parent who feels you can't do an interesting thing, maybe a good way would be to, to find a, a, a read aloud online or find a book that has been animated that is a short clip and that becomes like your trailer and you'll look at that and then look at the book. If you do email me, I can make some suggestions. I'd just like to know the age of your child. Yes, the connection between reading and expression largely is to do with language and ideas, no? So reading gives us ideas and reading gives us power over language and that both those things definitely lead to expression and the expression may be spoken, may be drawn, it may be written, it may be acting. So yeah, reading is very powerful in, in, in how it can help you become a human being. Ah, the house that has a large collection, I must come and visit. Uh, uh, do you read? Do your children see you reading? Uh, is this collection of books too overwhelming? There's a, there's a short uh, animated book called Girl Who Hated Books. Um, I urge you to, to, to both uh, look at it as well as show it to your children. It's this absolute wonderful story about a child who went up in a house that's full of books. Uh, and it's published by an Indian publisher called Josna Prakashan. Uh, please look for that one. It's called The Girl Who Hated Books. I, I, I've tried to answer uh, some of your questions and I really deeply thank you for raising these uh, these questions. Uh, there are still more. Uh, Shraddha, we have time. So then, yeah, I have five minutes more. So I'm going to try. Uh, yes, parent who says both children are different. It's quite startling to us, no? That sometimes you think if you're raising two or more children in the same house with the same parents, that their likes and interests will be the same. But we are human beings. We are a fascinating species who, who, who find interest and motivation differently. And so I think that's lovely that both your children have different choices in everything, including books. As a parent, you may have to help them as individuals rather than as a pair. And that does put more pressure on you, but that will allow each of them to actually find what their own interests are and develop it. And in time, they may begin to get interested in the other siblings' interests. But you may need to one to one in the beginning. Yes, the iPad. <laughs> the iPad is a good source to do. Use it for reading so you can always bargain and say it, you know, before you do what if your child's playing games on the iPad or something. You can find some read aloud sources and well, can listen to a story together on the iPad. Uh, please use the iPad for, for, for reading. It's a great source. Yeah, that's a great question about the filtering. It's, it's, you see, books are also products in the market and booksellers are also um, selling a product. And publishers are also marketing a product. So that's where those books like Ben 10 and all, you know, they just gain immediate attention. One, if one way is to ask, uh, you know, I'm sure this librarian in your school should be able to help you with recommended reading lists. Right now in India, the publishers, some very good publishers, you can use those. Uh, you are most welcome to email and ask me for a list or ask Shraddha and she will reach into me and I can give you a kind of recommended list. 
but it's good to have a filtration system because when you buy a book you're also spending money so you want to spend your money on what's a good book but for young children i urge you to find a library and join a library because uh, children consume a lot of books once they get hooked on and sometimes you think how many books will i keep buying but when you're part of a library you're actually sharing a very very rich resource uh, i hope in this lockdown period sometime there can be access for you to go into your school and borrow for home reading books the school library that would be such a wonderful opportunity yes uh, may we may not be able to balance in the sense that okay so much time for playing and so much time for reading because somewhere we also want reading to be a joyful thing but i think there is a rule of thumb that if you read with your child for 3 to 5 minutes every day in a preschool child then 5 to 11 minutes in the early grades you are already putting your child on the path to reading so since you are parents from nursery to standard 3 somewhere between 0 to 11 minutes is is the time that's all in the day to spend reading a book but every day with discipline then you're already doing something very powerful ha huh, yes for the mother or the father of the four year old who's not sitting uh you'll have to maybe start very very small so the first time is even both of you sit together and hold a book and put it down that gets done in 5 seconds and that's enough the next time maybe you sit hold a book and you'll open to one page you can find a book that has a very fascinating page if he's interested in transport or interested in animals look for that as the starting page and the cover so that his attention is fixed he doesn't necessarily have to sit even if he's standing running around and the book is open on a low table but you are there that's a start yes i do understand this i have worked with many many children who um who actually don't follow the usual norms of you know what we we'll say sitting in place attention and even they slowly come into this joy of actually being able to slow down with a book uh, so don't give up please uh so i'm going to say thank you i loved being on this session with you i hope it's been helpful for you uh i want you to know that my commitment to helping you is very strong so please reach out if you have any questions and please at the end of today each of you find something to read with your child and do it it will make me the universe and your child very very happy thank you uh on the next saturday shraddha reminds me i'm doing a session again with which is aimed at slightly older children uh parents of older children so if you feel there may be some value in tuning in and listening and taking this conversation forward uh i will be here again at 5 o'clock uh, next saturday and i look forward thank you